So let me hand over to Miss Sophie Crooks. She'll be covering hand injuries and fractures. There's some gory photos, so be ready. But I hope you enjoy it. Thank you very much, Emma. Okay, so yeah, we're going to cover hand fractures and some of the soft tissue injuries. And um, yeah, as we've said, so everything's been recorded. If you're not happy about that, just email. Uh, if you don't want to put a question in the chat, you can just email us and uh, Andre and Emma will ask at the end. Um, so I'm currently a CT2. I'm working in plastic surgery at St. Thomas's Hospital. Um, and hand injuries are a very, very common presentation to ED. Usually on one of my own calls, probably we get between five and seven acute hand traumas per day um, and often have to see a lot of them and bring them over to the hospital. It does encompass more than I can cover here, so this is going to be a bit of a whistle-stop tour um, and just try and cover the basics of anatomy, how to manage, um, how to examine them properly and then when to refer on. So starting with the anatomy, like I said, it does look very complex, but we're going to break it down into different components. So looking at the bones and the joints, first of all, as orthopods, we're very interested in that. So the metacarpals are there in yellow, then the, the phalanges are in blue and green and red. So you need to, if you're making a referral to either the hand team, either plastics or orthopedics, we want to know which one. In plastics at the moment, everyone refers to it as P1, P2, P3, from proximal to distal. And then you need to tell us if there's a joint involved as well. So the CMCJ is the carpometacarpal joint. The MCPJ is the metacarpophalangeal joint. The PIPJ, the proximal interphalangeal joint. And the DIPJ, the distal one. The thumb, being that it doesn't have uh, an intermediate phalanx, has only an uh, interphalangeal joint. Okay, and now we're moving on to looking at the different nerves. So if you think there's a nerve injury, we want to know which one, we want to know where it is. So the radial, median and ulna all supply sensation to the hand and then they split off into the digital nerves which branch one down each side of the finger. So we need to know the sensation for each side of the finger if you're worried that there's damage to the nerve at some point along the digit. Then we have the vessels. So obviously the radial and the ulnar arteries are the main supply to your hand. They form an anastomosis at the palmar arches. So even if one of those is damaged, you can still have good blood supply to the whole hand. It can be well perfused. If you want to test it on yourself, some people don't have very good um, joints between them and the arches, you can do the Allen's test. Um, so I'm sure you know about before you do AEGs, where you compress the, both arteries, get them to pump their hand and then release the ulna. We've talked about the palmar arches, so you need to be worried if someone has a stab wound to their hand or say during a carpal tunnel release, somebody's put an instrument slightly too far and then there's some bleeding. The palmar arch sits at about this level um, and you need to be worried about some bleeding from there. Similarly to the nerves, the digital arteries run down each side of the finger. In terms of where exactly they run, if you bend your finger and you see where the creases form and draw a dot on each crease, and a line between them, that's usually where your neurovascular bundle runs. Sorry, that's not actually writing. But it is slightly more on the volar aspect than on the, uh, the, the dorsal aspect when you release it. And then we've got the tendons and the muscles. It all looks very complex. There's a really complex system of pulleys that help stop your tendons bowstringing when you bend your finger. Um, and I'm not gonna cover those there. That's something if you want to go away and look it up, that's fine. Um, but we'll cover the basics of the flexors. So you have a deep flexor, so flex digitorum profundus, and a superficial one. The complex thing with this in the hand is that the deep flexor actually runs through, so in that kind of fashion, between, uh, as, the, as the superficial one comes in, it splits in two and inserts either side of the finger, and the deep carries on to insert onto the distal phalanx. We have to test those differently and we'll come on to that a bit later to try and isolate the two and find out which one you think is damaged. Then obviously there's the interosseous muscles, the interossei, that do your adduction and abduction, and then the, your thena and hypothenar muscles. Again, I'm not going to go into the detail of exactly 
which is what what what's included in those and the innovations and things like that but just being aware of how to test the movements and how you can isolate some of the movements so it's really important to take a good history um, in plastics a lot of it about the mechanism so specifically do they have an avocado hand which is a recognized complication of avocado avocado cutting and increased quite a lot in prevalence over lockdown because everyone was at home bored and baking so you've got to get a good way to cut your avocados but what we want to know other than what was the fruit involved was if it was a cut was the blade clean or dirty were they using an angle grinder that had fragments of tile or metal in it because that will guide you as to whether you think there might be foreign bodies still in the wound was it a sharp blade was it ragged because that will tell you what to expect in terms of damage. So if it's a clean slice to a tendon, it's gonna be much easier to repair than if it's a very, very jagged one and you're trying to put very ragged edges back together and you might need to debride that and that could affect your repair. We also really importantly want to know what position was the hand in? Because if you think you've got a knife, you grab the knife with your hand flexed and it's pulled out, as you release, these flexor tendons that were here are going to retract back down. And if say there's only a partial cut, as you look at it with the hand like this to examine through the laceration, the bit of the tendon there will look intact. It's only when you move them that you will see the part that's got the laceration come into view. So it can be misleading. I've been misled by one on a wrist where I looked at it, thought it was absolutely fine. It was only once I got the patient to do this movement that the 50 to 75% laceration of the tendon came into view. So it's really important to know what they were doing at the time. We also want to know their hand dominance. We want to know their occupation. Do they do something manual? Are they a concert pianist? And their smoking status. Smoking, like with everything um, in medicine, affects the healing. So the bones, the tendons, if we're going to repair them, can be really affected. And we also want to know their hobbies. Do they do knitting? Are they a professional rock climber? anything like that that could affect what we do. Then we're on to examination. So exactly the same as with orthopedics. Look, then feel, then move. So first of all, when you're having a look, you're looking for deformity. Is the finger dislocated? Is there an obvious fracture? Is the bone coming out of the skin? Are there any open wounds? This gentleman's managed to do himself a nice Brunner incision by scraping his finger down uh, a metal uh, fence. Brunner incisions are zigzag shaped incisions that we use just to stop them forming contractures and he's done a very nice one. Looking at this you want to have a look inside that wound. Can you see any damaged structures? So for him the question would be is the flexor sheath visible? Are the tendons damaged underneath? That might require you to do a ring block in A&E just to give it a really good look around to see if you can see any foreign bodies or any gross contamination in the wound that you can remove. We also want to look for any signs of infection. So looking for erythema, looking for swelling, looking for the position of the finger. We'll come onto it a little bit later, but in flexor sheath infections, the patient often holds the finger in a flexed position because it's number one, the swelling on that side, everything contracts and holds it fixed. And it's very, very painful to extend the finger. When you're looking for damaged structures, this is a wound that I saw a few weeks ago. There's a little white spot in it. Could be something, could be nothing. We gave him a local anaesthetic block and we had a bit more of a look. And as you can see, that's actually the end of his flexopolis's longus tendon. So he needed to go to theater to have a washout and have the tendon repaired. Okay. So then we're on to feel. So we want to assess for pain. Can you localize exactly where the injury is? If it's on the finger, where is it? Is it over a particular joint? Is, does it feel like a fracture? For fractures, if you have a feel of them, you can sometimes feel, well, often feel crepitous, where you can feel the bone kind of grinding against the other end. You can feel it moving around. Is there a foreign body in there? If it's very superficial and it's something hard, so say a thorn under the skin, you can often feel it and palpate it between your fingers which will give you a really good guide if you want to remove it with some local anesthetic as to where to make your incision and pop it out if it's really superficial. We also really importantly want to check the pulses. So checking both the radial and the ulnar pulses, 
and then checking the capillary refill in each finger individually. Moving on to sensation, so we would do the normal kind of radial median ulnar sensation, so checking your ulna on the, the ulnar border of the little finger, radial in the first web, dorsal web space and median on the tip of the index finger, they are autonomous sensory zones, but we also want a digital nerve score for each side of each finger and score it out of 10. So testing on the normal side, is it normal? What, what's this sensation? What's this? Is it the same? Give me a number for each side. It gives you a really good idea rather than having a patient who's referred to you and you go, what was the sensation reduced? Well, was it a two out of 10 and it's now a seven and it's getting better and we don't need to explore the nerve? Or was it a six and it's now a one or it's completely absent. It gives you a, a bit of a better idea of the progression. And then we need to move. So active and passive movement of each joint. So for hand injuries, starting at the wrist, having a feel over the bony structures, feeling down each metacarpal and into the phal uh, phalanges, and then moving each joint through its range of movement actively. So for this, I'd get them to make a full fist and straighten out. That's kind of a gross assessment of what they can do with their hand. And then I would go on and examine each finger individually in terms of movement. So in terms of movement, so this here is the examination for isolating the superficial flexor that we talked about earlier. Because they come from a common origin, if you isolate the other fingers, so the other fingers can't help, when you bend, you can see if it's working and that you need to do that, repeat it for every single finger. As you can see when you do this though, the tip of your finger, you can't bend it yourself. Okay. So then you want to check whether the tendon that does just that, so the FDP, the profundus tendon is working as well. So to do that for each one, you need to isolate just this joint. So holding the PIPJ where it is and getting them to just bend the tip of the finger. Because like we said, the superficial flexor inserts onto the middle phalanx and the, the deep one inserts onto the distal phalanx. So you need to check that they can move that by themselves. Then in terms of checking for extension, so you can check extensor digitorum communis by getting them to extend all of them. But you also have just an extensor that goes to your index finger. That's hard to test when you're doing that because it can be compensated for by the common one. So if you get them to make a loose fist and lay it on something and then stick their finger out up against resistance, it means the extensors, the common extensor isn't helping. So you can isolate your extensor indices. Moving on to the thumb. So you can't, I can't really isolate uh, flexor pollicis longus and brevis. So you just need to test it on its own or test them together. Um, but you can isolate extensor pollicis longus. So get them to put their hand flat on the surface and lifting the thumb off a flat surface up to the ceiling is mostly EPL. And then obviously you need to check the motor innervation to make sure it's not a problem with the nerves. The easiest way to do that that I've come across is to, with someone of any age, is to get them to play rock, paper, scissors and then give you an okay sign. So rock being your um, median nerve, paper for extension being your radial nerve, the great extensor of the arm, scissors being your ulna to do abduction, and an OK gives you the branch of the, the uh, anterior interosseous nerve. And then we come on to some investigations. So we want to look at the x-rays because we like bones. So starting from the metacarpals, if there are some nice metacarpal fractures like you can see here, what we want to know is, is there shortening, like we discussed with how to assess an x-ray um, in the very first session, is, is there shortening? So as you can see on this one, this bit should meet up about down here. So there's quite significant shortening of the first metacarpal there. Is there angulation? I would say with this, there's not significant angulation to any of those fractures. Is there rotation? So to assess for rotation, it can be difficult on the x-ray sometimes. If you get the patient to make a fist, if they have a metacarpal fracture, sometimes the finger that's affected will scissor over the other fingers. So usually the tips of your fingers when you make a fist should all point towards your, your um, carpal bones. 
if this one starts pointing off over here, there's something wrong and you need to work out where that rotation is coming from. Moving on up, you can obviously have uh, phalanx fractures and you can also have tuft fractures like this. So if you see there's a little fracture through here and on the lateral view, you can see it as well. These can be associated with quite significant soft tissue injuries, which might look closed because the nail is still over the top, but there may be a nail bed laceration underneath and they could actually be an open fracture. We also want to look for dislocations. If they've got a significantly deformed finger, is there a fracture or is it a dislocation? And that needs reducing urgently like any other dislocation in A&E. If it's a finger dislocation, you can do that under a ring block. So you inject some local anesthetic. There's different ways of doing it. Um, I prefer to go over the MCPJ and then a bleb just under the skin on the back. Inject it, the finger, whole finger will go numb and you will be able to manipulate it. And then one other quite subtle finding is something called a volar plate avulsion. So you have a volar plate which covers the front of your joint capsule and to provide stability to the joint. If that's a vault, so say in a hyperextension injury of the finger, it can pull off a little bit of bone with it. They can also come as just ligament injuries where you would need to then obviously immobilize them for that to heal. And that would actually be a longer immobilization period than for the fracture because ligaments don't have very good blood supply and they can take a bit longer to heal. But it's really important not to miss this because it can cause problems with function in the future. Okay, so then we're moving on to common injuries and management. This isn't a common injury, but it was too good a picture to not put in. But, so your immediate management is pretty similar to what you would do with any patient that you're gonna see in A&E who's complaining of a fracture or soft tissue injury. So good pain relief, that will help your examination. Remove any rings. So if anyone has a ring on an injured hand or an injured finger, it's gonna swell up really, really quickly and you won't be able to get that ring off and it can cause vascular compromise. If it's already quite swollen and you can't get it off, then either a ring cutter to try and put under it and cut through the ring, or if they really, really won't let you, you can try putting a piece of string under the ring, wrap the finger almost like a tourniquet to squeeze out the, the, the swelling. And then you pull the little bit that's remaining on this side and the ring can spin around the string and come off. You can try it at home. Then if there's any bleeding, same as you would for any other case. So pressure, elevation. We like Bradford slings. They're very hard to come by in A&E or on most of the wards even. A pillowcase on a drip stand will do just as well to keep them elevated. Then we want to give any wound a really good wash. We don't know where it's been. We don't know what bacteria there was on the knife or the piece of glass or the shard of mirror or the fence or whatever it was that they've injured themselves on. Give it a really good wash, try and encourage any foreign bodies, any small particles of dirt to come out. And importantly, check their tetanus status. Okay, so in terms of fractures, starting from the most dramatic. So an amputation obviously is a fracture unless they've managed to go through the joint, which is very uncommon. So this is a four year old who put their hand in a blender by accident and they've taken off, as you can see, the tip of their middle finger and almost the tip of their index finger. So we got sent the tip of the middle finger with them in some cling film. If you have a patient who has amputated a finger or any part of them, the best thing to do is put that finger or amputated digit into a specimen bag, like you would send a set of bloods in, then get some ice inside another bag and a bit of water to make a kind of ice slurry. And then, sorry, so wrap, wrap the amputated part in saline soaked gauze, then put it in a bag. And then you put that bag inside the ice slurry. You don't ever let the ice touch the finger because it can cause kind of frostbite. And we want to preserve it in as good a, good a condition as possible in case it's possible to reattach. Also really importantly, if you're gonna x-ray the patient, please put the amputated part in the x-ray. Even though it's not attached to them, we want to see what's going on. Is the bone too mangled for us to do anything with? And should we throw the finger in the bin or actually does it look okay and we can reattach it? Then metacarpal fractures. Oh, sorry. So like we've talked about, there can be shortening, there can be rotation. That's gonna affect your grip strength. It's gonna affect you if, you're, if it's your dominant hand in terms of writing and fine motor movements. 
then phalanx fractures and tuft fractures. And the question with all of these is immobilization versus fixation. So moving on to management of those. Here we have a nice example of all three, uh, well, three methods. So here we have a plate. So that's an open reduction internal fixation. We've got some lag screws and then we've got some K wires. That will be down to the stability of the fracture pattern and the preference of the consultant who's gonna be operating as to what they do. Uh, sometimes the metal work, if you're having to do it on the dorsal aspect, if someone's got really, really thin skin, it can be quite prominent and it can cause issues and they'll have to have it taken out again. So a K wire might be preferable, but that can be decided on a case by case basis. Then POSI. So POSI stands for the position of safe immobilization. So what it does, is it helps reduce any problems that would be caused by immobilizing the hand in the long term. So as you probably know, joints get quite stiff if you don't move them. And the smaller the joint, the quicker it gets stiff. So if you immobilize them with their wrist slightly extended and the MCP flexed at about 60 to 90 degrees, it helps stretch out the collateral ligaments down each side of the MCPJ, puts them on maximum stretch and it helps prevent it contracting and forming scar tissue and causing stiffness in the future. Then we want the PIP and the DIP in full extension to do the same thing. That just means that when they come out of the splint, they hopefully won't have to do quite as much hand therapy because their function will have been preserved a bit more. There's an option for buddy strapping. So I'm sure you've done that. This is a really bad example because they've not put anything between the fingers. And often if you buddy strap somebody, you send them to us and we see them three or four days later in our clinic, the skin in between, if they've not been taking it off and kind of being really meticulous with keeping it clean and dry can be quite macerated and kind of even broken down in between the fingers. So I'd always pop some just folded up gauze in between the fingers before you buddy strap. So this is an option for metacarpal fractures if they're not angulated or rotated and you think they're quite simple fracture patterns, they'll probably heal um, without too much deformity. If they've got phalangeal fractures, again, and it's not intra-articular, it's not a particularly unstable fracture. So often the, the kind of spiral fractures or the oblique fractures can be quite unstable and shorten. But if it's stable, you can always buddy strap it. And then we have Zimmer splints. Similarly, if you've got um, phalangeal fractures that you're not too worried about, um, even a tuft fracture, you could pop a little zimmer splint just over the, to cover from the middle to the distal phalanx so that you're not immobilizing the proximal interphalangeal joint to stop that getting stiff and you can encourage the patient to move, but it'll immobilize the fracture site. And then for tuft fractures, you've also got the option of using a mallet splint. That just holds everything steady. These are quite hard to find sometimes in A&E, um, or they can be too big or too small. You can just pad them with some blue gauze that you wrap around the finger and just gives a bit more stability and helps it fit a little bit better. So then we come on to soft tissue. So flexor sheath infection, I mentioned that earlier. That's really important not to miss. So this is a, a surgical emergency when it comes to hands. So this patient here looks like they might have had a little puncture wound over the, the palmer aspect of their finger, that can track into the flexor sheath, which runs around the tendons and also down into the palm. And if it gets infected, it can cause complete destruction of the tendon and really bad outcomes in terms of function. There's four main things to look for with flexor tendon infections. So these are called, uh, flexor sheath infections, sorry. These are called Carnaval's cardinal signs. So they are pain on palpation over the flexor sheath where it gets bigger in the middle and then gets smaller again. You have pain on passive extension. So if you try and extend the finger, it's gonna be really, really sore. I think the other one's erythema. So it's gonna be really red and swollen. This needs an urgent surgical washout. So they need to be started on antibiotics. They need to be kept nil by mouth and they need to go to theatre for a washout. That isn't necessarily as drastic as the incision that we saw earlier, which I said is like one of the incisions we use. You can make an incision over one of the pulleys, have a look at the pulleys for the flexor, where they insert on the flexors to hold them in place. Here, make a cut at the top and then either put a cannula, as you would use to cannulate any patient, in 
and give it a really good wash with a lot of saline, so flushing it out completely. And always flushing from proximal to distal so that you're not introducing the infection further down. Really good wash. Either you can open it up and put sometimes a, one of the little tiny like suction probes or something in there, um, but a cannula works really well. For patients like this, sometimes they could come in with two. So in the hand, the flexor sheaths, and it depends person to person, there's quite a lot of variation, but they are joined up. And sometimes the infection can spread down into the wrist as well. So like I said, really important to catch this early. A felon, so this is something that I hadn't heard about until I started working in hands, but it's an infection of the pulp space of the finger. So your pulp space has lots of septations, which help it be a bit firmer, holds everything in place. But if you get an infection in there, it can be really difficult to get out and you have to actually open up one side or the other of the finger and put some scissors in and open everything up and give it a really good wash out and try and break the septations to get into the area. But it can make the finger very, very swollen, very painful. Then we've got a paronychia. This is a paronychia that's been ignored at home for quite a while. Um, this lady cut her finger opening a soft drinks can about five or six days before and had kind of ignored the fact that her finger was becoming quite swollen and quite painful. And she also had diabetes. So when she came to us, she had very high inflammatory markers. She wasn't really feeling very well. And she obviously had this big collection of pus just around the edge of the nail bed, which is where the infection starts. So she had a ring block. We debrided all this unhealthy skin, washed out all the pus. And she went home two days later with it looking on its way to healing and much better than this. We also had to take the nail off to really get underneath it and let the pus drain from the nail folds. And then animal and human bites. So they're pretty much as bad as each other. Everyone says the human bite is the worst bite you can get, but they're pretty much all much of a muchness. What you want to be careful of is if you see somebody's hand who's punched someone in the face and they've got a little cut over their MCPJ. That's an open joint until proven otherwise if they punch them in the face because human teeth are quite sharp. They can cut through the skin and cut through the joint capsule. And you also want to be really sure there's not actually a bit of tooth left inside the joint capsule. So anyone with a bite needs an x-ray to make sure that the police dog hasn't left a tooth inside their leg that needs to be dug out um, to remove the source of infection. Cat bites are also not good. Uh, they, can, they can impregnate bacteria really quite deep through the soft tissue. Um, and they have under their nails a hollow area that can just capture bacteria and dirt. So even though the, their claws look quite clean on one side, on the underside they do have quite a lot of bacteria um, and can be quite uh, difficult to treat. Then another common injury that you'll likely see are nail bed injuries. So this looks maybe quite innocuous. He's got a little break in the nail here and a little bit of blood down there. Usually we say if there's less than 50% of the nail covered by hematoma underneath, so you see this little darker area, you can see there's some hematoma, then we can probably leave it alone. If there's more than that covered and the nail hasn't split, then that hematoma from underneath the nail can build up and the pressure can be really painful. And if the nail bed is cut, and you don't sew it back up nice and neatly, then as the nail continues to grow, that can scar and it can cause white patches under the nail and it can cause cosmetic deformity with ridging, but it can also cause the nail to ingrow um, and give them problems in the future. This gentleman also had an underlying tuft fracture. I don't know if I put the x-ray in, no, I didn't. And um, also had an underlying tuft fracture, which was why this split was there in the nail. So when we took the nail off, the bone was coming out of the skin. So this was an open fracture. Open fractures in fingers are dealt with slightly differently than anywhere else in the body. They don't need to go to theater immediately for a washout, but this did need a good couple of liters of saline to wash it down in our procedure room, to then sew up the nail bed, trying to reduce the fracture at the same time, and then put a good dressing and a splint on it. Then neurovascular injuries. So if they have changed sensation over the tip of the finger at your DIPJ, 
that's the level at which your digital nerve trifurcates. So it's about one to two millimeters down the side of the finger. And then at the level of the uh, DIPJ, it trifurcates obviously into three, which are too small for us to fix. So if they have a laceration further down and they have a, uh, a neurological deficit distal to it, we would explore that and you can repair the nail um, under a microscope, uh, repair the nerve, sorry, under a microscope. Again, with the arteries, fingers have really good collateral supplies, but if both sides are cut, so they've partially amputated the finger or something like that, then you will need to restore the blood supply because you're relying on just little bridging vessels from the skin that's intact, as opposed to actual proper blood supply. So you can, again, repair them in theatre using the microscope. And tendon injuries, extends the tendons, are a little bit easier to fix than flexors. So flexors, if you think about your grip strength when you make a fist, they're very, very strong. So if they're torn or completely or partially, if you've got a 50% laceration to a tendon and you don't immobilize them and they keep moving, it's eventually going to rupture. And that becomes much more difficult to fix because it's a, a kind of attenuation process of it's become weaker and weaker and then it's snapped. So then you're trying to suture up a very weak tendon. So anything over about 50%, we would take to theater and fix. And you need to put more sutures in your tendon repair on the flexor side than you do on the extensor, because like I said, it's much stronger. And all these patients, it's a really fine balance between immobilizing them for long enough that the tendon heals and it doesn't re-rupture and getting them moving. So like we said, that the, the fingers don't stiffen up. So anyone with a suspected tendon injury, have a look at the wound. Can you see the tendon ends? Can you see how much is cut? If you can't, but you're worried because of the examination that we talked about, so you've isolated your, your flexor tendons, um, then they need just a good non-adherent dressing and they need to go into a cast in the posi position that we talked about to immobilize them until they can be seen and assessed for surgical repair. So I don't know what time we're on, about right. Learning points. So the main focus is really gonna be your examination. So often with hands, it's quite a, a tertiary um, center that you'll be referring to. Not everywhere will have us on site. So being able to describe in detail, the examination to us over the phone is really useful, especially if you can send us some photos as well alongside it. So we can see the correlation between where the injury is and what the examination findings are. That's really useful. A social history is absolutely essential. We need to know if we're operating on the first chair violin of the London Symphony Orchestra, we need to know. And we need to get them into hand therapy and we need to get everything sort of sorted. Not that we wouldn't for anyone else, but it's useful to know. It also helps us manage their expectations post-operatively in terms of what they'll be able to do or how long they won't be able to play an instrument or do video gaming for. And ring blocks are your friend. The it's impressive how much you can do under a ring block down in A&E. It gives you an opportunity to examine them properly. So in terms of their motor function, because they won't be limited by pain. It also gives you the opportunity to have a look in the wound and have a little bit of a kind of explore to see what's going on. And when you're washing it, because like we said, we need to get any bits of contamination or any foreign bodies out. If it's been a dog bite, it's really important to give it a good rinse with two or three liters of saline to try and reduce the risk of infection. It will give you the opportunity to do that without the patient being so uncomfortable. If you get the opportunity to go to a &E with any of the doctors there and learn how to do ring blocks, it's really useful. It was something I really didn't get the opportunity to do very much. And it's all we do at the moment on plastics in terms of hands. You become very comfortable putting them in and it makes your examination so much easier. And then you can describe the findings to us. Okay, so we'll go for any questions. Thank you very much, Sophie. That was a extremely well structured talk uh, covering lots of essential things. If people are seeing cases in A&E out in the community or even when you're on call for plastics. 
got one question here, Sophie, uh, which was just posted just now. Can you ring block multiple fingers at the same time? Um, you can, but it just depends on the volume of anesthetic that you're able to give. Um, so if you need to, you can do it, but you just need to calculate the amount of anesthetic that you can give um, and maybe think about using some adrenaline. So I know they teach you not to use adrenaline in digits. Um, you can, you just have to be careful. Um, and it might be a case where it's worth using some adrenaline with your local, um, just so you can use a bit more volume to do multiple fingers. Um, also, if you warm up your local anesthetic and you add bicarbonate to it, it's much less painful for the patient because the injections for the ring block are really quite uncomfortable. I think last session we went over the block specifically for distal radiuses and people mm -hmm. asked about the doses. So it's as long as you don't overdo the daily dose. And yeah, the so usually amounts. I would I'd draw up about 10 mils of 1% yeah. lidocaine um, and then use somewhere between five or six um, but you've got a bit more just to top them up if you need to um, if you think you're going to be doing something a bit more extensive um, you can use uh, a wallant mix so that just stands for wide awake local anesthetic no tourniquet um, surgery so we do some of our more proximal um, operations in the hand using wallant so that's a mixture of lidocaine bicarbonate and um, adrenaline the adrenaline makes it last a bit longer because it's localized to the area that you put it in. So it's not being metabolized quite so quickly by the system. Um, but yeah, I'd say usually five to 10. I know some, some of the urgent care practitioners can do it with three, which I'm always amazed by. Um, but about five or so, five to seven is what I usually use mm. per finger. Yeah, and what Sophie said is correct. As I mean, as long as you're safe and you're calculating the safe dosage, for example, with lidocaine, it's three milligrams per kilogram. So as long as you're calculating that and then converting it into milliliters, um, you'll always be, you'll be all right. Yeah. Um, as Sophie mentioned, her, the, her urgent care practitioners are often doing these ring blocks. So if you do get a chance, if you're a medical student or foundation doctors get a chance to go to A&E urgent care, do take the opportunity because you can pick up lots of skills. Okay. Um, I was just going to say, so easy way to remember your dosing for lidocaine. Lidocaine has three syllables, three milligrams per kilogram. Lidocaine with adrenaline. Lidocaine adrenaline has seven syllables, seven milligrams per kilogram. Wow, I, I learned something. Good. Thanks, you, Sophie. <laughs> <laughs> that, is, that is pretty good. As long as you get your syllables correct. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> lidocaine right. with Sophie, adrenaline. we had... Uh, yeah, true. We had... A question earlier which we have answered but I think it'd be good for you just to emphasize the cardinal signs for flex tendon sheath infections so we people asking just to repeat those the four cardinal signs yeah yep. I think your connection dropped for a second there oh sorry yeah the internet's not very good so flexed position so it'll be held in flexion because it's really painful to extend tenderness over the flexor sheath so if you palpate down the flexor sheath it's going to be exquisitely tender to touch Erythema, it's going to be really red because it's infected. And then a fusiform swelling. So it's almost kind of torpedo shaped, but it swells out in the middle and then goes back in as it comes towards the MCPJ. Great. And we had a question about finger fractures, which I have answered already. We can also get your opinion. So the healing time for, for hand fractures. Bone takes six pretty much six weeks to heal wherever abouts in the body it is. Um, the Good, th we concur. Uh, yeah, the reason we don't immobilize them always for the whole six weeks is because of the risk of stiffness. So we can get them moving. We have hand therapists here who can make like thermoplastic, like molded splints that are individual to the patient. And if they need just this joint immobilizing or just this one, they can have a splint that does that so they can keep moving everything else. But yeah, six weeks. Yeah, six weeks. I just mentioned on the chat that tuft fractures, which are the, the distal phalanx fractures and underneath the nail, they can actually take up to three months to heal on x-ray. So people could, in the toes and the fingers, tuft fractures, they can have swelling and pain for up to three months, which is quite normal with that type of fracture. Um, Sophie, another question just in. Should all dog and cat bites be referred? 
pretty yeah pretty much so they will pretty much all animal bites um will need to be admitted for iv antibiotics um so yeah so either if it's your local policy that orthopedics take it then refer to ortho then otherwise plastics um we would usually admit we've admitted to a dog and a cat bite today here for antibiotics and elevation and, and as working in plastic working in plastics at the moment with uh, animal bites do you, plastics just take people with hand bites or do they take all body bites mainly hand bites um it just depends on what the wound looks like so for the cat and the dog bites on the hand it's often just a small puncture wound which then closes over um, so we often need to excise the skin around the puncture wound, even if, even if it doesn't look really grossly infected, we would excise the, the small area of skin around the puncture wound and just give it a really, really thorough wash. For example, something on the leg where a dog has taken out a big chunk and the wound is open, then we wouldn't necessarily need to see that as plastics. That can be managed locally by the appropriate team. So usually orthopedics can see them. If they need to take them to theatre for a washout, they can wash out the soft tissues but we wouldn't need to see them unless there's difficult, they aren't able to close the wound and they've had to debride too much. Mainly we would take hand, hand injuries for cat and dog bites. Thanks. So for everyone listening, uh, animal bites in the hand would usually go to plastics. If it's any other part of the, the upper limb or the lower limb, if, the, if it's just skin and a little bit of fat, it can often be managed just in A&E. For example, of the calves, the upper arm. However, if you notice that the bite is quite deep and you can see the fascia, or you're worried that the bite has gone through into the muscle, then that patient will need a washout in theatre. Animal teeth, especially dog bites, they carry a lot of bacteria and organisms. So we do prefer to wash them out if there's any breach of the fascia. If it's just fat and skin, it's usually a washout. If it's small, a washout and closure in, in A&E. Um, antibiotics they all must go home with a, mm. a week of antibiotics at least and some mm. sort of follow-up just to make sure, so, mm. sure someone looks at the wound whether that be your clinic or whether that be your gp practice nurse mm. clinic. the other okay. reason for referral is if there are too many bites so lately in orthopedics here we've had people with multiple dog bites so about 15 wounds on their right leg and another 10 on the left so you, there's no yeah. way you, you will have enough local anesthetic to close any of them. So we did them in theater with the washing out. Oh, do you mind Actually, just stopping your, your, your sharing, Sophie? Because I'll share a few sorry. things while we're talking, while we're going through the questions. Sorry, yeah, sometimes keep going, Emma. when we're washing them out, you actually find out that two of the bites connect with each other. And actually they were much deeper than first expected when you were looking with the eye. But yeah, antibiotics always cover in the tetanus injections. And I'd say as well, if you're in doubt, just call us. In terms of plastics you can always just send us some photos and we can have a look at it and give you some advice even if we don't need to see them we can give you a bit of help all right there's a tetanus shot um we would have to check on the vaccination guidelines to see when actually children get their tetanus injections Oh, I can try and bring that up. Yeah. yeah. What the pediatric vaccination schedule is. Oh, so they get given them at age 8, 12, and 16. Oh, that might be wrong. Oh. Primary. Two, three, four months of age. There's the clinical guidelines for squat and NHS, which says primary dose. Three doses, one month apart, two, three, and four. That's got but, okay. It's got yeah, but the minimal. Usually, if they if it's an adult who comes to A and E, we would just give them a tetanus booster if they've not had it within the past five years. Yeah, yeah. Which actually ends up being most adults. Yeah, yeah. All right. How would you recommend incision and drainage of paronychia? So paronychia, number one, you need to take the nail off, which will often help just release some of the pus um, because they can, be so, they can be more extensive than they look in these in when you see them. So the one I showed you was a bit extreme. This is more like what you will see, but that pus can track under the fingernail. So you would take the nail off and then wash down the side of the epinychial fold 
it's the nail fold. Um, if needs be, you can do an incision if it's pointing directly over the area of pus and then you need to debride all the unhealthy tissue. So often that, that skin will have separated from the layers underneath and you can peel that off back to nice healthy bleeding tissue. So to, I know I've said a couple of times about removing the nail. So to do that, you do your ring block and then a pair of blunt forceps is usually the best thing that you can shove kind of under the nail, between the nail bed and the nail. And then the lovely description I got the first time I did one was get your needle holder, put it under, clamp it, and then roll it as though you're unrolling the lid off a can of tuna and just roll it <laughs> and pull it off. It's Good great to think about, but it's better, it's better if you're actually doing it. <laughs> Um, how common is compartment syndrome in metacarpal or phalanx fractures? I can't say I've personally ever seen it in the hand, actually. Yeah. No. Has anyone else? No, Sophie, Andre, no. Very no, not that common. Does anyone else have any questions? few more coming in so sophie when you're doing your paronychia operation there's a question here mm -hmm. well, once removed do you have to provide packing to the nail bed to stop it closing or is there any other special measurement uh, management of an avulsed or removed nail <clears throat> so sorry, it's about removing the nail so if it's a paronychia and you've taken the nail off and you can see that there's an area down the side of the nail where there was a big hole that was full of pus I would take like an inodine dressing or something and just pack it just to keep it open for the first couple of days. And then when they have their first dressing change at the GP, they can take that off. And as long as it's clean, they can just redress it with um, something non-adherent like adaptic touch. If it's a nail bed removal for a nail bed laceration, take it off as, as I've described. And then you need to put some small sutures in the laceration. So a kind of a 6-0 Repeat, so a dissolvable suture because it'd be really painful to take out but very very fine sutures to bring the nail bed back together and make a nice smooth surface for the nail to grow over and then usually it stops bleeding quite easily it is quite vascular tissue um, but we tend to just dress them with an adaptic digit so a non-adherent dressing and then the finger dressing that rolls down but with a layer of like blue gauze in between the two layers just to provide some pressure and then elevate it but they don't usually keep bleeding. Once you close the laceration, it will help with the hemostasis. So in terms of putting the nail back, that's up for debate. Here um, in my current unit, the, the consensus is just take it off and leave it and it will be fine. Some places I've heard about kind of sewing tin foil into the nail bed to keep the matrix okay. Um, or putting the nail itself back and suturing that back in. I don't think it really changes the outcome from what I've seen here. Um, and it's just another kind of thing that could give you complications. Um, so we usually just take it off, make the patient aware that it's gonna take two to three months for it to grow back and that the nail bed underneath will be really quite sensitive initially. Because if you've ever cut your nail too short, that bit on the end of your finger is super sensitive to touch anything with and it will be like that, but worse. So they will need to keep it dressed and kind of padded, but the skin will harden up quite quickly. But we don't put them back routinely here. Yeah, so Thanks, this is a subangual hematoma that is big enough that you'd need to take off the nail. Some people advocate trefining it. So where you put like a, mm. uh, um, a needle through the top of the nail and you can release the hematoma and release the pressure. Yeah, like that. But most times, the reason the hematoma is there is because there's a nail bed laceration, so it needs to come off anyway. Um, and often the blood can just clot and it just doesn't come out very easily. Thanks, Sophie. I think that concludes the questions. Okay. So thank you very much, Sophie. Again, good luck with your registrar post in a few months.